Hello to our Pleasant Green parishioners and listeners. This is our Sunday School lesson for September the 15th, 2019. It is lesson number three out of our Unit 1, our Fall Semester Study. Uh, This is from our uh, Pathway Study Guide and our... Unit 1 is entitled, God is Faithful, and our lesson uh, for today is entitled, Where's the Food? So it is lesson 3, entitled, Where's the Food? And if we were looking from our other study manual, the standard lesson commentary, Our same lesson is entitled, Faithful During Uncertainty. And our devotional reading is 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, verses 9 through 15. Our background scripture is Exodus, the 16th chapter. And then our printed passage is the 16th chapter of Exodus, verses 1 through 8, and then verses 13 through 15. And our lesson's key verse is, When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. And this is Exodus, the 16th chapter, verse 15. Now our lesson's aims are to contrast God's provision in the wilderness with that of Israel's former slave master in Egypt. Regret times when you have complained of God's seeming failure to provide. And finally, express thanks for the many ways that God takes care of his people. And our lesson uh, for this Sunday is divided into three sections, and the first section is for the analysis of our biblical texts. The first section is Exodus, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 5, and this section is highlighted, Bread from Heaven. And then our second section is Ingratitude. It's highlighted or entitled Ingratitude. And these are verses 6 through 8 from the 16th chapter of Exodus. And then our final section is entitled What is This? And this would be verses 13 through 15 from the 16th chapter of Exodus. And so, again, uh, our lesson, the writer or the author of this article of our lesson uh, chose to take a spin from a commercial some years ago that just kind of went uh, nation or na- uh, national uh, across the board and uh, uh, even outside of the country. Um, it was an advertisement for a fast food chain uh, called Wendy's. And Wendy's uh, was trying to advertise the size of their burgers uh, compared to competitors. And they coined uh, a statement which was entitled, Where's the Beef? Where's the Beef? And some of you may recall that commercial. Um, It was said uh, in all types of different circumstances, uh, which were alluding to the fact that something was missing or something was inadequate 
or something wasn't what it was supposed to be. And so the response was, where's the beef? So the writer chose to use that, and instead of beef, he uh, um, implied food. Where's the food? And so we will begin uh, uh, indulging into our lesson. And uh, as always, we uh, want this to be under the observation and approval of Almighty God. So we ask for the intervention of the Spirit of God to impart unto us the things He would have us to know and understand as we read through our lesson. Now, our lesson can probably be summarized or our lesson can offer us insight uh, just from two scriptures uh, out of the book of Lamentations. And uh, this would be the third chapter of Lamentations, uh, verses 22 to 23. Uh, and I'll read it aloud as we indulge into our lesson. And this is Jeremiah speaking of the faithfulness of God. And uh, our lesson is in the unit entitled, God is Faithful. And that's why I wanted to lift this at the beginning of our indulgence into our lesson. And Jeremiah says in the third chapter of Lamentations in the 22nd verse, he says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. As we read through our lesson and encounter uh, the disgruntledness, the murmuring, the grumbling, complaining about uh, the leadership of Moses and Aaron and their lack of faith in God who had already brought them through a miraculous deliverance and brought them out of bondage, uh, oppression, and suppression under the hand of the government of Egypt. And after God had freed them, if God had not done anything else, but after they were freed, the method and the circumstances and the instances that occurred in the process of their freedom should have been enough for the children of Israel to recognize and realize that they had the all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, all-ever-present God on their side and that God had demonstrated that God was with the people of Israel, the children of Israel, and had demonstrated God's presence in the face of the children of Israel and the enemy, and delivered them at several occasions where they felt that they were at a loss and they were about to be overcome or they were about to be killed by the Egyptians. And if we, in your spare time, if we would look back at just two occurrences that took place right before our reading of the text in the 16th chapter, but back in the 14th chapter, where we begin with the pursuit of the Egyptians against the children of Israel. And they came unto the Red Sea, and we know the story 
of how God parted the waters and let the children of Israel walk across the uh, the bank, uh, walk across the floor of the Red Sea on dry land, and then allowed Israel to see the Egyptians come behind them and then be consumed by the Red Sea, folding over and drowning the Egyptian army. And they lived to see it. And just shortly after that, they began to grumble because of the area they were in and there was lack of water. And we read this uh, into the 15th chapter of the book of Exodus. I believe it's the 15th chapter around about the 22nd or the 20th verse through 25. And it talks about how there was lack of water, uh, but there was a stream of water present, but the water was bitter. Uh, the water was undrinkable. And then the Lord again performed a provision for the people and told Moses to place a tree into the water which neutralized the bitterness of the water and made it drinkable and again made a provision and provided for the children of Israel. And yet we get to the 16th chapter and now they're in a desert plain uh, just uh, in the rain or in the region of the Mount Sinai. Uh, the scripture refers to it as the wilderness of sin. And now there is a shortage or a lack of food. And although they had the demonstration and the testament of God's power on several incidents prior to this, they again move into a mindset of doubt and complaining. And this brings us into the beginning of our lesson, the bread from heaven, uh, in the verses 1 through 5 in the 16th chapter of Exodus. And what we as the church and as present-day believers have to ask ourselves while we may be uh, ready to uh, cast uh, accusations and statements and railings against the children of Israel and how the scripture tells us of their response uh, to a never-failing and uh, always-present God, uh, we also should ask ourselves, how many times have we doubted the presence of God in our lives? After we, and a lot of times uh, we hear this in testimony and we hear this uh, uh, in songs uh, uh, in the reference of when I look back over my life and see what God has done. And then we speak of how our mouths shout hallelujah. Thank God for what God has done in our lives. And so uh, that also brings to mind to us that just as the whole community of Israel began to uh, hail or grumble against the leadership of Moses and Aaron, and they begin to speak about how, uh, in verse 3, about how they had it much better in the land of Egypt, and that it would have been better for them if they had not been freed and just died in the hands of the Egyptians, where at least they had meat and bread, and it was available unto them, even though they were in bondage, and even though they had cried out to the Lord to be freed 
from the enslavement and the bondage that they were in. But when they received freedom, then they began to plain, complain that the freedom that they received wasn't the equivalent of the bondage that they were suffering from. And isn't that uh, similar? Uh, sometimes uh, whatever our suppression, uh, the bondage does not have to be uh, the same circumstances of the whole nation of Israel under the uh, servitude or under the oppression of Egypt. But whatever it is that is against the will of God and it has us constrained or it has us contained where we're not able to free ourselves from that bondage and serve God is considered a suppression or an oppression. And so sometimes, uh, especially in uh, this current social status we find ourselves, uh, we are in a materialistic and capitalistic uh, world where value is assessed or value is uh, the equivalent of tangible things. And so a lot of times we equate a success not with the spiritual development of an individual, but with what tangible materialistic things we see. So the value of an individual is not based upon the inner person, but more so on the outer person. And so uh, sometimes when we think about what God's provisions are, God's provisions are our needs and not our wants. And a lot of times we are angry or we are dissatisfied with the provisions that God provides for us because they aren't the equivalent of the materialistic, tangible things that we become accustomed to in our bondage. And so a lot of times uh, our bondage may be that we may have become uh, contained or constrained by sexual desires uh, through the media of laptops and notebooks and cell phones and when God frees us from that attachment to lustful desire uh, then God provides for us a provision that is acceptable unto God but because it does not still contain the lust and the sinful nature of what we became accustomed to, now we're dissatisfied because the freedom that God provides is not equal to the sin that Satan provides. And we want the same results, whether it is that we became attached and uh, everything we see we had to have. And so we resorted to uh, forcefully taking things. We became robbers and thieves. And we stole what we wanted. And so then when we're freed from that. Then we want the provisions that God provides. We want those to still be equivalent to the things that we took by force. And so the same thing happens here with the children of Israel. They begin to reflect upon what they had access to while they were in Egypt. And now it appears that 
we have nothing. So they begin to rail against Moses and Aaron uh, by speaking that now you have brought us out here in the middle of nowhere and now we're going to die from the lack of food while at least while we were in bondage, at least we had meat. We didn't have the best of meats, but we had meat. We had bread. We had uh, substance. And so now you all brought us out here and now we have nothing. But as we read further into our lesson, uh, Moses tells them that God was going to rain down from heaven bread for them. And he tells them that it was going to take place in the even, or shall I say in the evening, God was going to provide quail, a meat for them in the evening. And then also he was going to provide for them the bread from heaven in the morning. But there came also some guidelines as to how these were to be received. And the manna is a uh, stouts of grain. Uh, therefore, uh, manna in the Hebrew was a word that was used for something that they didn't understand or didn't know exactly what it was. And so it was referred to as manna, but it was the provisions of God. It was something new that they had not seen, and so therefore they weren't familiar with it. And that's how it is sometimes when we are released from uh, bondage. We come into a new era. We come into a, a new picture a, a new unfolding of God's provisions. And the new is not the old. And because we're not accustomed to the new, we can only reflect upon the old, not recognizing that if we've been delivered, then what is before us must be greater than what's behind us. So when we look at the lesson uh, God gives instructions to Moses to give to the children of Israel, and he tells them that this new bread that he's provided from heaven, this new provision that he's made for them, that it has to be consumed uh, in certain stages. And so therefore, they were to go out and only take what was needed for that day. So that eliminates that uh, we could go out and just consume as much as we want. That is a uh, attitude and that's a behavior that was developed while we were in bondage. Because there's a thought of, there's a lack of, and there's also a practice of greediness. And so there is the practice of consuming more than what we need and take as much as is available. But God gives instructions that we are, the children of Israel, were to go out and only take what was needed for the family, for the individual, for that day. The only time they could take more than that was on the day before the Sabbath. And on that day when they were to rest, the day prior to it, they were supposed to take twice the amount so that they would not be working or they would not be out into the fields and then working to pull the grain, the manna, the bread from heaven on the day that was set aside to worship and to honor God for God's provisions. And so... Uh, a lot of times when God uh, moves us into a new uh, era or moves us into a new covenant or agreement, there are instructions that are given 
that fall upon the agreement of the new contract. And that is, is that it will be fulfilled if we will follow these guidelines. And so the provisions of God so that uh, they are not utilized with the same mindset that was developed while we were in bondage. And so here we find that God is instructing the people as to this is how I want you to obtain the bread of heaven that I have provided for you. And when we go into the second section of our lesson uh, titled Ingratitude, uh, we see here that it's lifted that they still murmured and complained. And so, again, Moses, just think about how many times uh, the speaker, the messenger of God, has to repeat to the people what God has already said 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 times already. And again, it must be recited to the people again. So when we look in verse 6 and 7, Moses again gives them instructions and tells them that in the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your grumbling, your complaining against him. And then he says, who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. And so, uh, a lot of times, uh, this is twofold. Is one for the leaders to understand that when they are charged to give instructions unto God's recipients, the people of God, to know that the anger that is displayed from the reception of the message from God to his people is not directed at the messenger, but uh, it is it is uh, identified as though it is hewed at the messenger because they can't uh, hew it at the all ever present and at the same place at the same time, almighty God. But really, their dissatisfaction is not against Moses and Aaron. They happen to be the individuals that they can hew or that they can cast their railings and complaints against. But they really are dissatisfied with God. After all that God has done for them, they are still dissatisfied as though you still haven't done enough. So uh, leaders have to understand, as well as the receivers, that the anger is lack of faith. Lack of faith causes us to be uneasy. It causes us to be uncertain. It causes us to feel that uh, we are at our wits end, and because uh, we recognize that the circumstances are beyond our ability, then uh, it's kind of a, a, a play on our mind and our faith at the same time because it also says there's an uncertainty in our walk and in our uh, faith practice because if we recognize that we were living in concert and in the covenant and in the agreement with God, then we would know that God is going to provide for us. But because we recognize that we have shortcomings, 
because we recognize that we have not fulfilled our obedience unto God, then we feel subconsciously that we're due punishment, that we're due the results and consequences of our actions. And then we begin to say, maybe now we're going to be chastised. Uh, maybe now God is going to uh, uh, discipline us. And so that uh, he brings in the uncertainty. Uh, and so then we begin to cast our uncertainty on the leaders. And then we say, it's your fault. You brought us over here. You got us into this mess. It was your direction. It was your decision. Uh, so it's easier to pit the blame on someone else than to recognize the shortcomings of ourselves. And this is what uh, we look at even though there was rebellion, there was complaining, God still provided. He provided the quail just as he said in the evening and the bread in the morning. Even though it was something that they didn't recognize, it was still exactly what they needed. The manna, which is stouts of grain, and therefore it falls into the uh, food supply of granular or grained food, is still used, a lot of chefs still use what is uh, uh, biblically referred to as manna, is still used in the preparation and the making of loaves of bread. And even though sometimes uh, we look at certain things that are identified biblically as though they may not still be present in this day and time and in use, but there are quail farms that, uh, and quails are, referred to as smaller uh, chickens. Uh, they look similar to uh, different breeds of pigeons, but uh, there are quail farms still today. Uh, they, they are breeded uh, to use as feed for other entities. Uh, the quails produce eggs and there are egg farms uh, per, that uh, carton and uh, actually uh, uh, place into cartons and cases uh, and the eggs are actually sold. And so uh, even though we're speaking of it in biblical time, uh, it is still these two things that are mentioned in our text are still used today. So I wanted uh, our lesson, one of the things that was mentioned in our aims was express thanks for the many ways that God takes care of his people. And we see this towards the end when we look at how God provided for them the meat in the morning, and I mean the meat in the evening, by the provision of the quails, and then the bread in the morning by the presence of the manna. But I wanted to uh, look at it in another perspective. There is a song uh, that is titled, So You Would Know. And it's sung by the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. And I wanted to just read uh, just one of the verses and chorus for you, uh, just to put into perspective about uh, the ways that we should thank God for the caring of his people. And it starts off and it says, how many times must I prove how much I love you? How many ways must my love for you I show? How many times must I rescue you from trouble? 
for you to know just how much I love you. It goes on and it says, didn't I wake you up this morning? You were clothed in your right mind. When you walked upon a problem, didn't I step right in on time? When you got weak, a long life journey, my angels carried you so you would know just how much I love you. In your spare time, uh, it may be appropriate to listen to that song, bring it up on whatever social media you have, and just uh, let that song bathe your mind while you're reading through the lesson. Because I think it answers that third aim of our lesson. So as always, we hope that something was said uh, in our lesson that is food for thought. And most importantly, that it will bless you in a way that is acceptable and approved by the will of God. And that it may also make us better lights in a dark and dying world. God bless you.